Hi everyone, welcome back to the University of Guelph Arboretum. My name is Michelle and I'm the summer naturalist here at the Arboretum. And for today's video, I'm gonna be talking to you guys about the different patterns found in nature. At first glance, it might seem like the natural world is sporadically organized, but if we take a closer look at the different organisms found in nature and their attributes, we can quickly uncover many patterns. And one pattern we can all easily relate to is symmetry. So most animals belong to a group called the bilaterians. And bilaterians are animals that are bilaterally symmetric. So when you look at a bilaterian, like humans for example, and you draw a line across the middle of them, both sides should be mirror images of each other. So humans are good examples of bilaterians. You can also think of a squirrel, for example, and bilateral symmetry isn't only found in animals. You can also think of the leaves of a tree. So let's take a closer look at this maple tree. So when we take a look at this maple leaf, we can already see it has a line drawn across the middle of itself. And so if we folded this leaf along that middle line, we would find that both halves are the same. So this is an example of how plants can also be bilaterally symmetric. Another type of symmetry frequently found in nature would be rotational symmetry. So unlike that bilateral symmetry that we just went through, where you're drawing a line through the center of an object and it mirrors itself on both sides, rotational symmetry is where you rotate an object by its center point and it'll match itself up to the original picture. So for this, we can imagine a flower with an uneven number of petals. If we rotate this image, as we rotate it across its center point, it'll eventually match itself up to the original picture. Other types of patterning in nature would be spots and stripes. So we can think of the body patterning of an animal. If we can think of a gray tree frog, for example, Gray tree frogs have a lot of uh, blotching and kind of spotty patterning across its back. Gray tree frogs also have the ability to slightly alter their color depending on the time of day and amount of light present. So by having this kind of blotchy spotty patterning across its back and being able to alter slightly its coloring, gray tree frogs are able to break up their shape a bit and camouflage more into their environment which is pretty useful for evading predators. We can also think of some moths will have spots on the back of their wings. So if we look at this polyphemus moth, we'll notice it has spots across the back of its wings. These spots are called eye spots. And in the case for the polyphemus moth, it has two very large eye spots. These eye spots are meant to give this moth a bigger and more intimidating look to hopefully deter predators from going after it. But now if we switch things over to stripes and we think of a skunk, skunks are really recognizable by their, their distinctive stripes. And unlike the first example of the gray tree frog, the skunk isn't trying to camouflage using its stripes. If we think of the natural environment of where skunks live, there's nothing that would blend in uh, there's nothing for the skunk to blend in with its black body and white stripes. And that's because the skunk is actually doing its best to be noticed. One of the best defense mechanisms that skunks have are its smelly musk. When a predator gets a whiff of that really strong musk, it's very unattractive and unappealing for that predator to try to uh, eat that skunk. But that musk is actually really valuable in part because of how well of a defensive mechanism it provides the skunk but also because of all the time and energy that the skunk has to invest to produce that musk after a skunk uses its musk there's actually a period of time where it has to wait for it to replenish itself before being able to use musk again so it actually goes through a window where it's slightly more vulnerable and because the musk is so important Skunks don't want to have to use their musk without a real cause. So those stripes act as a warning to predators 
that they shouldn't try to uh, go after the skunk because it has a really good defense mechanism. So it's one way that skunks try to preserve their musk. So when we look at body patternings of animals, we can gain some insight about how valuable those patternings are. It may seem like animals sometimes just look the way they look, but sometimes there's actually a real reason behind certain features, certain physical features of an animal. Another type of pattern you can find in nature are test locations. And this is a pattern of tile-like structures that make up an object. So we can think of the comb of some beehives, how it has that hexagonal tile-like pattern that replicates itself and makes up the entire comb structure. We can also think of a snake's uh, scales. If we take a really close look at a snake and all of its scales, you can see an almost tile-like pattern of small units, those small scales, making up the entire body of the snake. Another pattern you can frequently find in nature is the Fibonacci sequence. Some of you might be thinking the Fibonacci sequence is just something you learned in math class, and you'd be correct, this is a mathematical concept. And this is where I think patterns in nature get super interesting. Because on one side of things, patterns are very visually pleasing, and some people might try to find patterns in nature just to enjoy looking at them. Patterns can also tell us a little bit about an organism and can be a piece in the puzzle of identifying them to their species. But now we have this bridge between a mathematical concept and nature, and it's super interesting to find that uh, so commonly seen throughout nature. So the Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers where the next number is the added sum of the two previous numbers. So it starts off with one, one, and then two, because one plus one is two, and then three, because one plus two is three. Then it goes to five, because two plus three is five, and then eight, because three plus five is eight, and so on and so on. It continues for basically forever. And we can find numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, the Fibonacci numbers they're called, all throughout nature. We can even find them on our own bodies. So for example, we have two eyes. That's a Fibonacci number. We have five fingers and each finger has three separate segments. And a spider has eight legs. These are all Fibonacci numbers. And we can continue to look across different organisms found in nature and we would continue to find different Fibonacci numbers. It's pretty amazing uh, just how frequently this series of numbers is found in nature. And where it continues to get even more cool, in my opinion, is if you divide two of the Fibonacci numbers, they have to be numbers that go after one another. So for example, eight and five. If you divide those two numbers, you'll get the golden ratio, which is about 1.618. And this golden ratio is again, seen throughout nature. It makes a sort of spiral pattern. And so you can think of the spiral on a snail's shell or the unfurling of a fern's leaf. And you can think of it seen in a lot of flowers as they uh, blossom. You can see that sort of spirally shape. And on a pine cone, a pine cone is full of these spirally shapes. So it's pretty amazing to see how frequently this golden ratio is seen in nature. And there's also somewhat of an artistic component to the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. Because if you're able to draw this sort of spirally shape, you can draw a whole lot of different organisms in nature. Something I really enjoy because I'm not a very good drawer, but if you can apply this mathematical concept, now you can draw all of these different types of organisms, which is pretty fantastic. Here we have the golden rectangle. The golden rectangle and the golden ratio are both concepts built off of using the Fibonacci sequence. So for the golden, re golden rectangle here, it's a rectangle that's composed of squares and rectangles whose sides follow the golden ratio. And if we draw an arc through the corners of each square or rectangle in the golden rectangle, we get a spiral. This spiral shape made from the golden ratio and the golden rectangle is seen throughout nature. 
Like I mentioned earlier, the golden ratio can be used in art to draw organisms like snails or fiddleheads. And artists might also use the golden ratio to create aesthetically pleasing compositions for an image. Fractals are another commonly observed pattern in nature. A fractal is a never-ending pattern where a shape is essentially composed of replicating units of itself. So for example, if we take a look at this fern, and we take a look at the blade of the fern, which is essentially the leafy structure of this fern. We can take a note of its general shape. Now let's zoom in into one of the smaller components of the blade, which is these pinnae. The pinnae is the smaller leaf section of the fern. Well, the pinnae has the same general shape of the blade. Now let's take an even closer look at what composes the pinnae these even smaller leaf structure which also have that same general shape so in theory a fractal will continue to replicate itself the more you zoom into uh, the components that make it up and in theory the reason why uh, a plant might want to arrange itself in this fractal pattern is because it's a very energy efficient way to take in sunlight and to transport nutrients across the plant I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about the patterns in nature, at least some of the patterns you can see in nature. I definitely encourage you guys next time you go on a walk to try to find different patterns. You'd be really quickly surprised at how many you can find even on a short walk. I hope you guys will join me next week for another video. I'll see you guys then.